This Honorable Court of Criminal Appeals of Tennessee is now in session. Thank you, Clark Hevner, and I want to thank your staff and the staff at the AOC for making this uh, Zoom session possible today and appreciate all the hard work uh, you've done for us uh, uh, throughout the, this year and, and keeping us connected. Uh, problems exist from time to time, and uh, we may have to use a uh, result to uh, a, a phone conversations. Uh, with Mr. Centauri, if it continues to, to plague him, he can just call in. Uh, I don't know how to do that, Mr. Centauri, but the people that have got me up here uh, know how. So just bear with us and we'll get you on here because you, your argument is certainly one that needs to be heard. I'm going to ask the clerk to call the, case, the, the next case and then I'll have more to say. William Casey versus State of Tennessee. This is the call of the uh, uh, third case of the docket here in Knoxville, Tennessee. We appreciate you being here today. Uh, I'd like to introduce you to a wonderful panel that you have today, not because I'm on it, because of the other two gentlemen I'm fixing to tell you about. Judge Robert Holloway from uh, Columbia, Tennessee, Judge Tim Easter from Franklin, Tennessee, and I'm John Everett Williams from Carroll County, Tennessee. Each side is given 20 minutes uh, uh, per side. And then Mr. Santori, if you will tell me how much time you would like to reserve for a rebuttal, I'll try to keep up with that time for you and, and give you a hint as to when your time is about to expire. Uh, with that. Uh, Thank I, you, Your Honor. With that, then uh, Mr. Santori, please introduce yourself and tell me how much uh, time for rebuttal you would like. Yes, Your Honor. Thank you. I am Francis X. Santori Jr. from the Greene County Bar representing the petitioner William Casey and I would like five minutes for rebuttal. Don't know whether I would need all of that, Your Honor, but if you could give me that, I would appreciate it. We never punish anybody for giving back time, Mr. Santori. <laughs> I would assume not, Your Honor. May I proceed with the court's permission and the permission of the learned uh, Attorney General? Yes, you may. Thank you. Thank, thank you, Your Honor. And again, if I'm an old fashioned guy, I'm a 20th century guy in a 21st century world. If I happen to freeze up on you, uh, please forgive me. But as I said, Your Honors, I represent Mr. William Casey, who is aggrieved by several errors of his learned counsel. Counsel who, by the way, are my dear friends from Kingsport. He is aggrieved by three specific trial errors and by 13 errors, which the same counsel had, we believe, in pursuing the appeal at the Court of Appeals level. This is, without getting into the history of the case, this is the second time that this case has been up on appeal from a post-conviction proceeding to this honorable court. Your honors, the biggest thing that I want to get across without basically getting into all of these 16 issues that I raise is this. I feel most respectfully that it's the duty of counsel. And I know that Mr. Matthew Spivey on the record mentioned a particular trial strategy and he didn't want to raise all the issues. And I'm paraphrasing Mr. Spivey, my friend. Uh, he didn't want to raise all the issues with Mr. Casey in his case, either on trial or on appeal because he didn't want to make the court mad at him. Most respectfully, as I think I wrote in my brief, I think that we can raise these issues honorably, respectfully before a court and I think we have a duty to do so. And I honestly believe that Mr. Spivey and Mr. Spivey, father and son, in failing to raise these issues, caused Mr. Casey to lack the effective assistance of counsel. And I believe that with respect to the standard, as stated in Strickland and Baxter, which is basically not a preponderance of the evidence, but by clear and convincing evidence, we have proven that. The 16 issues, while discreet, your honors, in combination are so egregious together that they constitute cumulative error. Now, this concept had sort of troubled me 
because at the time that I wrote this brief, if your honors please, I knew that the Supreme Court, our Supreme Court had basically recognized the cumulative error doctrine. Whether this honorable court had was a question that was sort of tenuous. I believe though, and I can't cite authority, and if the court wants me to supplement my brief, I certainly will, but I believe that this court now recognizes the cumulative error doctrine. The 16 errors that we raised in and of themselves may or may not prove ineffective assistance of counsel, but together they comprise what I believe to be ineffective assistance of counsel. There's such things as failing to exclude hearsay testimony from this victim's mother who testified as to the authority that uh, my client supposedly had over the victim. One of the elements, your honors, of the crime, crimes for which he was convicted was the fact that he had some authority over the alleged victim or the victim in this case, since there is a conviction. And most respectfully, there was never any um, instruction by the honorable trial judge who is a colleague of yours, Judge Montgomery, and whom I knew judges before he was even lawyer Montgomery. It's been that long. I knew his family, knew his mother, knew his father. But most respectfully, uh, there was no instruction given at the trial court level. All this hearsay stuff came in about the authority that the uh, that my client supposedly had over this victim. And with respect to that, that was the only way without an instruction that the jury, I believe, could have found authority. Now, was this raised by the uh, counsel in this case? No, it was not. That's one example. Another example uh, goes to the testimony of a diocesan priest by the name of Reverend David Bettner. He testified as to my client's silence when he was confronted with something. He testified as to some other things. But with respect to that, and most respectfully, what his testimony did not prove by a preponderance of the evidence was the venue. And nowhere here, most respectfully, by a preponderance of the evidence, was there ever any proof that this crime or these series of crimes for which he was convicted, my client, were occurred or did occur in Sullivan County, Tennessee. It's not necessarily the most essential element of a, of a criminal prosecution, but venue is still something that has to be proven by a preponderance of the evidence. And that's another example. It wasn't, um, it wasn't done. A third sort of general uh, error here, and I'm not trying to take all 16 of these errors and particularize them, I'm just trying to do them in generalities, the testimony that was elicited from Bettner and the hearsay testimony that was admitted both into trial, both of which trial counsel and appellate counsel failed to either object to or failed to brief as an error, basically um, allowed the state to make an improper election of offenses. We get a lot of of evidence, your honors, in this case that supposedly shows that Mr. Casey commits 15, 20, 25 different crimes someplace. And these were elections were improperly made and the jury was allowed to infer of many, many other crimes or that he had committed, excuse me, many, many other crimes other than that for which he was indicted. And I guess the biggest thing, if your honors please, is that appellate counsel, we believe, was ineffective in that 
nowhere in the brief that at least I read did appellate counsel raise the federal standalone claims of due process, equal protection, et cetera, et cetera. And this becomes very important, your honors, because most respectfully, if this court happens to deny our relief, if we go to the Supreme Court on an application for permission to appeal, and either the Supreme Court denies that application or grants it and then denies us relief at that level, it could very well prejudice any 2254 claim for habeas relief that we have up in the federal court. And the big thing that we would raise in federal court, it's not proper here now, but the big thing that we would raise in federal court, obviously, is that the staleness of the prosecution violated the federal constitutional rights of this plaintiff. Um, with respect to all of these, again, we most respectfully state that discreetly and standing alone, that is discreet, D-I-S-C-R-E-T-E-L-Y, discreetly, discreetly, these claims, each of them, could raise ineffective assistance of counsel. But we believe that the cumulative error doctrine, which this court is now considering, as well as the Supreme Court, as a device for a post-conviction petition, or finding, if not in a post-conviction petition, for reversing and remanding in a direct appeal, we think that these all are factors that show that there was ineffective assistance of counsel. We believe that this shows by clear and convincing evidence, all of these errors and the failure to preserve all of them at trial and at the appeal that Mr. Casey was denied the effective assistance of counsel. And most respectfully, we believe, and I'll sum up my argument in this way, we believe that this was not just a, quote, trial strategy, end quote. We certainly do understand the law, your honors, that a trial attorney is not going to be second guessed for his, quote, trial strategy, end quote. They may have had a strategy, and the strategy that I saw basically to attack the staleness of the uh, conviction was a good strategy, but there were other strategies that were available here that should have also been used. Um, I mean, I think venue, I think, um, you know, not being able to discern if I were a juror without a jury instruction, what, a, what is meant by an authority figure or a person of authority, which is an element of the crime, I think that those are things that basically have to be brought forth to the jury and it constitutes a very serious error. So that is my direct argument to the court today. Does the court have any questions of me and was it able to hear me without me breaking up? We were very able to hear you and matter of fact, could see you as well. Thank you, Your Honor. Any questions from the panel? Is this here on a motion to reopen uh, post-conviction, or is this uh, a, um, a post-conviction filed within the one year of the highest court's opinion? Judge Easter, it is a post-conviction filed within one year that originally, and I have to, to say just very briefly a little bit about the history of this case, originally it was filed Judge Jim Goodwin, the post-conviction judge in Sullivan County, good judge, Judge Goodwin mm -hmm. made the preliminary ruling going through the petition, tossed out a lot of the counts that we thought were relevant. We had one post-conviction hearing. We filed an appeal to this court. It was an appeal that the state agreed that the court basically was an error in throwing a lot of these things out. So that's why it's seemingly taken so long if you looked at the record. It was remanded, we had a hearing, and this has been timely appeal. Thank you. With that, we'll hear from the state now. Thank you. And you have your five minutes for rebuttal. Thank you, Your Honor. 
May it please the court, Catherine Redding on behalf of the state. Um, I will attempt to endeavor just to address the issues that defense counsel has raised today. Uh, it, counsel uh, has discussed his claim that uh, he, that the petitioner is entitled to relate to the ineffective assistance of counsel uh, because trial counsel failed to request a jury instruction on the definition of custodial or official authority. Uh, however, the petitioner has not proved this claim. Uh, the petitioner cannot show that counsel was deficient when this court held on direct appeal that the charges given by the jury instruct the, jur the trial court fully and fairly set forth the applicable law that the charges did not confuse or mislead the jury and that the proof was sufficient to sustain the petitioner's conviction. Um, regardless, the petitioner has failed to show prejudice from counsel's alleged deficiency in failing to request an instruction on the definition of custodial or official authority. The proof at trial showed that the petitioner was the head of the victim's school, that he was the head priest of the victim's church, that he was considered by the victim to be a father figure, and that he repeatedly received permission to take the victim on overnight and out-of-state trips. And given this proof, it's unlikely that a jury would have reached a different verdict had the trial court given a special jury instruction on the definition of custodial or official authority. Um, that is the only claim that counsel's address regarding uh, ineffective assistance of trial counsel, so I'll move on to the claims of ineffective assistance of appellate counsel. Uh, counsel touched on, well, I believe touched on the first claim uh, that counsel was ineffective, appellate counsel was ineffective for failing to appeal the trial court's refusal to exclude uh, David Bautner's, Bautner's uh, testimony at trial. First, the petitioner failed to prove this claim by clearing convincing evidence because there's nothing in the record indicating that the petitioner actually moved to exclude uh, Botner's testimony at the trial. He did file a motion to exclude his testimony from the motion to dismiss hearing, but there's nothing in the record showing that he sought to exclude his testimony at trial and thus the trial court actually uh, um, refused to exclude that testimony. Further, although appellate counts, uh, counsel testified at the evidentiary hearing that he sought an appellate issue regarding the denial of his motion to exclude Boatner's trial testimony lacked merit. Uh, petitioner at the evidentiary hearing failed to ascertain whether counsel was talking about uh, Boatner's trial testimony or whether he was talking about Boatner's testimony at the motion to dismiss hearing. I failed to elicit any testimony about why appellate counsel thought this issue lacked merit and failed to elicit any testimony about the election and venue issues that he's referenced in his appellate brief. And a venue, a failure to make a venue argument is not raised here as a standalone issue. It's not one of the claims that this court sent back down for remand, uh, but it is kind of wrapped into this first claim about Mr. Boatner's testimony. Uh, and I just point out for the court's benefit that the victim testified at trial and he testified about where these uh, acts of uh, sexual abuse occurred where the rapes occurred. Uh, so testimony would have established venue would, would have come out from the victim's testimony. Um, as to the next claim, petitioner has not shown that appellate counsel was ineffective for failing to appeal the trial court's refusal to exclude um, Boatner's trial testimony about the suspension letter. I think that counsel kind of hinted at this argument uh, in this argument just now. Uh, but the petitioner failed to elicit any testimony at the post-conviction hearing about Boatner's trial testimony or about the suspension letter because there's not any proof in the record about this. Uh, this court would be forced to speculate about the reasoning behind counsel's decision and whether any prejudice resulted from his actions. Um, I believe the next claim addressed is uh, the assertion that Appellate counsel was ineffective for failing to appeal the admission of hearsay statements by the victim's mother, but the petitioner has waived this claim. Uh, the petitioner's brief fails to include appropriate references to the record, such that the statements by the uh, victim's mother that he asserts are hearsay can be identified. Uh, because he failed to provide an adequate record, the petitioner has waived this claim. The petitioner the next claim that he raised here today uh, is an assertion that appellate counsel was ineffective for failing to appeal the admission of evidence, showing that he was silent uh, in response to questioning by a diocesan official. Uh, 
But as the post-conviction court found in its order denying relief, the petitioner failed to elicit any testimony or offer any proof at the post-conviction evidentiary hearing about this issue. So as a result, the petitioner has failed to prove that counsel was ineffective uh, or that he's entitled to relief. And the final claim uh, regarding appellate counsel discussed today is an assertion that appellate counsel is ineffective for failing to raise standalone constitutional claims on appeal. But the petitioner has again waived this claim. Uh, this court, when this case first came become, before this court, uh, this court identified at least 17 claims of ineffective assistance of appellate counsel that the petitioner had preserved and specifically laid those out and remanded for an evidentiary hearing just on those 17 claims. This court did not identify counsel's failure to raise standalone constitutional claims as one of the claims that was preserved to be considered on remand. Uh, and further, the petitioner did not elicit any proof or any testimony at the evidentiary hearing regarding this issue. And as a result, the petitioner has failed to prove that counsel was ineffective in this respect. He's not entitled to relief. And um, because the other claims of ineffective assistance of trial counsel and appellate counsel have not been addressed today, I'll stand on my brief on those. Uh, and as to the petitioner's next claim, but Addressing the petitioner's claim of cumulative error, the petitioner has also waived this claim by raising it for the first time on appeal. As I mentioned, this court found that the petitioner preserved four claims of ineffective assistance of trial counsel and 17 claims of ineffective assistance of appellate counsel and remanded specifically for an evidentiary hearing just on those issues. Uh, this court did not identify cumulative error as one of the claims the petitioner preserved on appeal uh, for remand consideration on remand. And further, the petitioner didn't provide any proof or argument at the evidentiary hearing about a claim of cumulative error, uh, nor did the post-conviction court address cumulative error in its order denying relief. The petitioner has also waived this claim of cumulative error. If there are no questions from this court, uh, the state will stand on its brief as to the other claims that have not been addressed here today um, and ask that uh, this court affirm the judgment of the the Thank you, General. Mr. Santor, you have your five minutes. Thank you, Your Honor. Um, and I do have a clock on my phone here. And I appreciate this. And I don't think I'll take even five minutes. General Redding, Your Honors, first of all, mentioned that the standalone claim had not been raised. It was not raised in the first post-conviction petition. Uh, excuse me, I, I beg your pardon, the cumulative error, pardon me, the cumulative error was not raised, but I will state most respectfully that very, very rarely, if ever, is it raised in a trial sort of setting, and this is a trial setting. When we went up the first time to this court, we were con considering only the original errors that I had raised, and the court the lower court having stricken most of those, this court again said, we're going to remand on this limited issue. But I would say to the court most respectfully that I think that cumulative error can be noticed in by this court at any time. That's the first thing. The second thing, again, your honors, General Redding, I most respectfully believe does not uh, think that we should have had a specific jury instruction as to what constitutes official authority. I don't believe most respectfully that this court or any court can ask a jury to infer what an element of a crime is if it is not specifically instructed. So that definitely cause some prejudice, most respectfully. And with respect to the third claim, and this is the last claim that I will touch on that General Redding touched on, she said that we allegedly waived the issue as to the mother's hearsay. Most respectfully, we cited it in the first appeal most respectfully, we cited it in our original petition to the Sullivan County Court, Criminal Court, which is 50 to 60 pages in length. 
most respectfully, we have a huge record. And I understand that this court can't go, I think one judge said it on the federal bench, picking through a record like a pig picks for truffles in the forest. We understand that, but it is in the record, at least from what my old mind can garner. So that's our rebuttal to the state. We, of course, will also stand on our brief in this case. Mr. Santori, most respectfully, we allow you to be the pig to pick through the truffles and point them out to us. <laughs> I can, yes, sir, I know that. <laughs> and we appreciate you doing so. Uh, this, there's nothing that comes before us that really is a laughing matter, but, uh, uh, and I was not laughing at the seriousness no, no. of these cases, but uh, uh, it's, it's a pleasure to deal with folks that are intelligent, that uh, deal with these uh, issues professionally. Some of these issues is, uh, are against good friends, as you said. Mm -hmm. uh, I appreciate you taking these cases and do this because it, it is sometimes difficult and our practice of law is, is sometimes difficult. Mm -hmm. But uh, I hope uh, there is a, the, law, the state of the law and in ineffective assistance of counsel claims is a client is not entitled to an effective, ineffective assistance of counsel claim. Mr. Santor, you are, 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 are clearly uh, above the game and do not believe in that and you provide effective assistance at every level that you can. And I appreciate you taking this case in these ways and these manners. And even though the issues are difficult and they put they push the judges to the brink, I hope we don't have any around and I, I'm not aware of any that are that are, are, are mad. Juries can get mad, but ju right. judges know what the roles of attorneys are. And uh, um, I think we should, we, 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 we give it hard we should take it hard and we, we can deal with it. So uh, uh, with that, uh, there's nothing that's offended me today uh, in the presentation. And I, I appreciate you, you uh, uh, providing good advocacy for your client as well as the state is going to stand their ground as well. And Ms. Redding did, did that equally. Uh, sure, yeah. And we appreciate that. So with that, unless there's something from either of the members, we will ask the clerk to, uh, uh, put us in recess to the call of the next case. This honorable court is now in recess until two. Thank you, Your Honor. Yes, sir.